The history of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council reflects the history of government and law in the United Kingdom. It stretches right back to the Curia Regis, or the Royal Court of Norman Times. This court carried out all the business of government, advising the sovereign on legislation, administration and justice. But over time, with the development of the House of Lords, the House of Commons and the courts system, the council gradually began to define itself as the place where individuals who wished to ask the sovereign to consider complaints about errors by the courts would try to bring their case. This made the council, in effect, the most senior appeal court in the land. It met in a building which became known as the Star Chamber, situated on the bank of the River Thames within the site of the current Palace of Westminster. By the time of the Tudors, the council began to form two distinct bodies, a judicial court to deal with appeal cases and an administrative council advising the sovereign on governing. Under the Stuarts, the council's court faced intense pressure from those who wanted to curb the powers of the king. Eventually, the changes during what is known as the Long Parliament of the 1640s removed the council's powers in England, but it retained jurisdiction, a power to determine legal questions over other countries governed by the crown. A major fire in 1698 destroyed much of Whitehall Palace, including the Privy Council Chamber, which had transferred there earlier in the 1600s. Hearings were moved to new offices nearby. In the early 18th century, it was decided that all legal appeals from British-owned plantations overseas would be heard by the council. During the rapid expansion of the British Empire, the number of jurisdictions looking to the Privy Council as a final court of appeal grew to such an extent that in the 19th century, it became necessary to create a statutory judicial committee. With the creation of the committee came much clearer rules about the conditions under which appeals would be heard. This was formalised in an 1833 Act, which also set out its membership. Later Acts enabled the Council to appoint senior judges from some of the other countries to the Judicial Committee. The idea was that the Committee would help create a system of common law for the widespread parts of the British Empire, while hearing each case within the legal framework of the laws of the country in question. The Committee's grandly decorated chamber and neighbouring offices had moved into a new building on Whitehall in 1827, designed by Sir John Soane. The Committee's rooms later became part of a larger building constructed by Sir Charles Barry in 1845, which still stands today on the corner of Downing Street. At this time, the Committee heard cases from a wide range of sources. Ecclesiastical cases relating to church organisation and doctrine were referred to the committee from 1832 alongside appeals from the Court of Admiralty relating to the collision and salvaging of ships. Given the breadth of its jurisdiction, it's not surprising that a number of famous cases were heard by the committee during the 19th and 20th centuries. In 1832, it heard an appeal against the governor of Bengal by subjects objecting to the forced prohibition of the practice of sooty, where the wife of the deceased was burned alive on the funeral pyre with him. In 1932, it gave judgment on claims by a Canadian historian that a manuscript she sent to a publishing house was plagiarised by H.G. Wells in his book The Outline of History. And in 1961, in a case involving an oil spill in Sydney Harbour, it ruled that defendants who wrongfully caused loss only had to pay for the loss which was reasonably foreseeable. This principle has since been widely applied by other courts. But the 20th century saw the tide turn for the extent of the committee's jurisdiction. By the 1920s, it said that people living on around a quarter of the world's land could potentially appeal to the committee. But in 1931, reflecting the greater freedoms being given to the countries which made up the British Empire, Parliament passed a law which enabled British dominions to withdraw the right of appeal to the Privy Council. More recently... Some Caribbean countries have similarly withdrawn the right to appeal to the committee by joining the Caribbean Court of Justice, a court of appeal launched in 2005 to serve states in that region. Today, individuals in 27 current and former Commonwealth countries, UK overseas territories, Crown dependencies and military sovereign base areas still retain the right to appeal to the committee. The Judicial Committee still plays a role in interpreting the constitution of those countries which have adopted them, as it has done throughout its history. When the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom was established, 
it was felt appropriate for the Judicial Committee's chamber to be moved to the same place, as many of the same judges would be sitting on cases heard by the two different courts. The co-location of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council and the Supreme Court creates a single hub, entirely separate from legislature, government and ministers, where the most senior judges interpret the law and develop it where necessary. The role of the senior judges serving on the Privy Council has not changed, but placing them alongside the Supreme Court sends a clear message about the value the various Commonwealth, ex-Commonwealth and other jurisdictions attach to an independent judiciary and the rule of law applied for the benefit of all society. You can find more details about the role of the committee, forthcoming cases and recent judgments at www.jcpc.gov.uk.